fine. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Sunset Safari here at Juma, the western fringes of the Sabi Sands Game Reserve, which in turn are the western fringes of the Greater Kruger National Park. I am speaking at this volume because this elephant cow, who is deeply pregnant, is not more than 10 feet from me. She's been very kind by feeding in front of us at this speed. So uh, Viam was just trying to get my attention there. Viam is on camera. My name is James Hendry, and we're sitting on the Mahindra here, second drive for the Mahindra. Uh, our vehicles are playing up a little, but that means that uh, my position is slightly different from normal. Now, if you happen to have joined us for the very first time, that's very exciting to me and you're most welcome. And I hope that you will ask us questions and give us your comments, hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. Remember, this is completely live. That elephant is eating this Combretum calinum or variable bush willow bush in front of your eyes as it's happening. It is a fantastic, fantastic thing, this. On the other vehicle while we watch her feed is Scott and he's being filmed by Brian. She's watching us carefully now. She's listening to my voice. I'm going to be quiet for just 10 seconds. Listen to what's going on. So you can hear it's completely silent. It's a hot day. It's about 36 degrees centigrade, 96 degrees Fahrenheit. And this elephant cow, I don't know if you heard her chewing there, but she's chewing bits of twigs and bits of leaves that she's pulling out of the trees here. Normally, as I've said a few times before, the elephants would be eating grass at this stage of the season. They wouldn't be eating on the trees. This is really winter forage that they're going for, but they have no choice at the moment. And you can hear there are no birds calling. There was one drongo that went in. Otherwise, it's completely silent. You may hear the odd fly as it buzzes past the microphone. You might hear the scrape of her skin as she rubs one foot against the other like that. And as soon as I stop yakking, I find that the peace of this afternoon just kind of washes over me. I'm going to try, I'm going to do it again, just for 10 seconds, if you don't mind. Mm, it's just wonderful. Now, all around us, of course, she's not alone. There are various elephants and bits and pieces of the woodland here eating combretum, eating whatever they can find. And the elephants are doing okay at the moment. I'd say she's probably going to be under the, some of the most nutritional stress, of course, simply because she's eating for two. That baby doesn't look like it's too far away from coming out of her. Isn't just this the most perfect afternoon? It's hot, but it's not, it's certainly not um, unbearable at the moment. And so it's very pleasant just being out here. Did you get the drongo there, Viam? No, never mind. There was a, it just quickly flew in behind her. Let's move a little bit forward. And I'll show you what I mean by a drongo. Drongo is a blackbird that will follow the elephants and try and hawk up the insects at the elephants dislodge with their feet as they move along. Hmm? What's in front of me? A drongo. Okay. Now 
Now, Peter, you're on Twitter, and your question is a valid one, which I'm not sure I can answer. You want to know how many months it will be until this female elephant gives birth. Unfortunately, I'm not much of an um, elephant obstetrician or birth specialist, but Peter, I would say it can't be more than two months away. Remember, a gestation period of 22 months, almost two years, the fetus is in utero, as it were and she's very swollen on both sides of her belly, just under the spine there, you can see at the back. And I think that not more than two months left, I would say maybe even less, but I'm afraid I couldn't tell you for sure. Now there are a few more birds calling in the distance, a, a black colored barbet going, too puddly, too puddly, too puddly, too puddly, too puddly, too puddly. Couple of rattling sticklers. Gee, gee, ticka, ticka, ticka. A lovely chin spot bat is called the most peaceful call of the afternoon. Oh, and a batalier also. Wow, wow, way in the distance. Gentle wind blowing from the southeast. It's the most gentle way to start an afternoon. <laughs> Very spectacular indeed. You can see the clouds, more political clouds, building in the western hemisphere. Of course, they've come scudding over the Drakensberg Mountains with great promises of moisture but there's no rain predicted at all for today or indeed probably for the rest of the week. There is some predicted for next week, but of course, as you keep watching the weather forecast each day, so it seems to move further and further away. So no rain in the offing, I don't think. I think we're still in for a bit of a rough time. Anyway, time will tell. And I don't, certainly don't think that it's a necessarily awful thing, as I've said before. It's just the way things are, and for millennia, of course, this area has been going through drought and flood, drought and flood, and our little blink of a human lifespan is so small in comparison with the cycles of this area that I really don't think it's anything to worry about. Let's head across to Scott Dyson. He's sitting with the Unkahuma Pride, and he will keep you updated on their progress. I'm going to sit with these elephants for a little bit longer. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Inkohuma Pride. Happily, one of them has popped their heads up to greet all of you. I know Hunter and Country Girl were excited to see lions this afternoon, so you guys have got off to a great start, as I'm sure the rest of you are also happy to see these five ladies here. My name's Scott, I'm teamed up with Brian on camera, and you'll see his little thumb squeezing into the frame there. So an important character on the Safari Live team, the Thumb. These five girls were here this morning. Interestingly enough, though, there's a chance that they were chased off a buffalo kill last night, and that doesn't happen very often. There was a lot of meat remaining. Brent's headed out there first thing this morning, expecting to find them there, nibbling on the leftovers. But alas, they were gone, and there was a lot of sign of hyena activity in that area, so possibly they were overthrown. None of them are bearing any wounds, and maybe they decided it just wasn't worth the fight. Either way, that was an unexpected surprise. But what was certainly not a surprise was that we would find them again here this afternoon, fast asleep in the midday sun, as I'm sure James has colorfully explained to you guys with lots of adjectives as to how hot we actually are. It is a scorcher. And because of the scorching temperatures, we can expect these lioness to, in all likelihood, not do too much for the next while. And because we had such an exciting morning with the cheetah on the property, having not seen one for seven months, I'm told, somebody did the maths there, and it was seven months till we saw the last one, I feel that we would, should probably all agree that our interests should be focused on the cheetah, which is much more likely to be moving now, even though it's very hot, as our leopard, but these are the laziest of the big cats in the Sabi sand summer and usually only get active after dark. So we'll maybe spend a couple more minutes here 
Just keep an eye on them. Maybe we'll get them to lift their heads up. Not that we'll get them to. Maybe we'll be lucky enough to see them lift their heads up. We're not going to try out and go out of our way to do that, of course. I just find it absolutely remarkable that they decide to lie on top of one another. I mean, bear in mind they've got a fur coat that we don't have to deal with, so they must be even warmer than we are. They don't have the ability to sweat, but who knows, maybe panting is a more effective way of cooling down. But the fact that they are even lying close to one another is hard for my brain to fathom. But they are social cats, and one of the most sociable cats on the entire planet, and I guess they're staying true to that now. What's interesting is that when we arrived here, they actually had, a few of them had their heads up, which I really wasn't expecting. Um, and who knows what may have caught their attention, who knows, maybe it's just too hot to even sleep. But out in this direction, kind of to the right over here, but deep in this thick bush, where Brian's pointing the camera now, we did hear a few branches breaking, and it's in all likelihood in elephants, the lions did prick their heads up and have a look in the, that direction, but didn't seem too perturbed. Had it have been a Cape buffalo, it would have been a very different scenario, and even then, in the heat of the day, these ladies could get up and active. Another thing that's hard to explain is going to answer the question to Donna in Rhode Island, and she would like to know, why is it that lions don't go into water, or do they ever go into water? And no, ordinarily, they will avoid water at all costs, even on a hot day like this. It makes absolutely no sense, because if they are forced to, they are capable of going into the water, swimming across a river. In Botswana, where there's large deltas that fill up during the rainy seasons, the lions are completely comfortable with the water, but will seldom ever use it to actually cool down. The only animals in this area that do do that, or carnivores, are the hyenas. Lion, leopard, and cheetah are all not interested in bathing, yet tigers are. So who knows? And jaguars will throw themselves off the banks of the Pantanal River in search of crocodiles or caiman alligators. But the African cats are not that interested in the water. It's actually hilarious watching them cross rivers or rocky crossings because they turn into real ninnies. Debbie, you would like to know where exactly are these lions on Juma? And the good news is they are slap bang in the center of Juma to show you and emphasize exactly how slap bang in the center we are at the moment. I will pull out my little map and I'll be able to show you what I mean. So, you have a look there. The glare does seem okay, so we're good. We are the central blue spot right in the center over there. Oopsie, you see, I haven't been charging my phone. Naughty. Um, and that is slap bang in the middle of Juma. Juma's this square, and Arethusa is that square. And that is how we are interconnected. South is where my thumb is now. North is up there, so it's all orientated as a regular map would be. And boom, there we are. We couldn't be much more dead center, I don't think. So I don't think they're gonna be going anywhere during the course of this afternoon's drive. We don't have to fear that they're gonna cross over a border anytime soon. If anything, quite the contrary, our fears should be that they are going to remain asleep until our safari is finished, which is not what we want. Oh, look here. This lioness was kind of chuffing those lips of hers. I'm not sure if she was dreaming or if she was just trying to get rid of some flies. She's clenching a little paw, or rather large paw, rather. Sound you may have heard. Chip, chip, chip. 
was a Red Bull Oxpecker that just flew overhead. A very good indicator whilst out in the African bush. Oh, there's a little bit of cuteness, and I think that this is our cue. We've cashed in on a bit of lion movement, and now I'm going to follow a lot of your advice and suggestions, and that is to go and look for the cheetah, which I'm more than happy to do, and I think is the correct option. So, goodbye, ladies. There is a chance, though, that we're going to have to say goodbye to you. Yeah, we're going to have to say goodbye to you now, having some trouble starting the vehicle, but don't worry. We know the, the way around that. Over to James, and see you later with the cheetah. Goodness gracious, I nearly missed that uh, indication from Kirsten McLennan Smith, who was directing this afternoon. I managed to turn my radio down. We have moved very slightly, slightly up the road. The elephants are still feeding on the same tree species as they were a little bit earlier. Now, that tree species, as I mentioned, is called Combretum collinum, or the variable bush willow. And it seems to be really favored by the elephants. And if we taste it, and uh, which some of you would have seen me do, and compare it to the taste of something like a red bush willow, which of course is the most common tree that we find in the woodlands out here, you can taste the tannin difference. There's definitely far less tannin in the Combretum collinum than there is in the Combretum apiculatum. And if you want to know the difference, now, it's not a particularly fascinating difference, this, but it might be worth your while. Viem, if you can just zoom in there on the sort of tips of that small leaf tree, that there is Combretum apiculatum, the red bush willow, very tanniny. And then the tree, of course, that the elephant is eating is Combretum collinum, the variable bush willow. The leaves are much larger, much less rich in tannin. And you can see the tree, and there are a couple of really fantastic examples of this tree around the place, has adapted to dealing with abuse from elephants. Now, I use the term abuse, of course, facetiously. The elephants are not attempting to abuse the tree at all, but you can see that they have copped a horrible beating from elephants over the years. Those trees are probably decades old, and they've got lots of stumps coming out of the ground. Whereas you would normally have, of course, if that tree was growing in a garden, it would be like a standard issue tree with one trunk coming out of the ground. Because it's been eaten by elephants so much, you find that lots and multi, it's called multi-stemming. It coppices every time it's damaged from the top, a new stem will come out of the ground. And that's why it's probably actually one tree that those two elephants are feeding on. Now there is a herd heading off down, I think probably towards Did you hear that? The wonderful sound of infrasound calling to each other. I was saying, I think they're probably going to head down towards the water at Galago Pan. The rest of the herd has kind of just melted through the woodland there. Desiree, you want to know if we ever named the elephants. Only, Desiree, if they've got a kind of really obvious feature. They're not that easy to identify, and of course they do move around a huge amount. They're not territorial, which means that they will sometimes be here and sometimes not. So two great examples of elephants that we have sort of named are uh, one that you saw this morning, if you were watching, called Fang. And Fang has a recurved tusk that comes out the side of her mouth and then turns back towards her to the extent that it looks like she probably knocks her knee on it every so often. So she's very obvious and very easy to spot. And then there's, of course, the female that's had half her trunk chopped off, or sort of a third of it. We don't really know how. And so she's been kind of named Half Trunk. And those are the only two that I know that we kind of have named at the moment. The others, the reason we do name animals, or the reason we're able to name animals that we know around here, particularly the lions, uh, or the lion prides, and the leopards, and sometimes the hyenas is because they're territorial and so they spend most of their time on this reserve so when we see them it's very easy to know who they are the elephants it's not quite the same thank you desiree okay our plan this afternoon is going to be to go along this road here it's called zoe's road if you're vaguely interested and 
there was a cheetah, of course, seen this morning with Scott. Very exciting to find a cheetah around here. I did walk this road during the course of the middle of the day and didn't find any tracks of it going to or from uh, where it was seen this morning. So we're going to drive very slowly along this road and see if we can't find signs of that magnificent, uh, what do you call them, Via? Cat? Running spotted, spotted running cat. Hmm? Spotted running cat. Spotted running cat. Marvelous. Now, while we're driving along here, Larry B, you want to know about elephants' eyesight and how well they see after dark, given that it will be dark fairly soon. Larry, um, we don't know for sure, but I have heard and I've read that elephants probably have eyesight quite similar to ours. I don't think they see much better than we do in the darkness, so it's not terrible vision, good on a sort of moonlit night, but I don't think they've got particularly strong night vision at all. There you can see the clouds coming in a bit. The sort of washed out white middle of the day sky has turned a very pleasant blue color. And there was something I was sent yesterday by a viewer and I thought that I should mention it while we're driving along today just given the fact that I didn't know the answer to it yesterday and so thank you this is why this job is so wonderful is that our viewers often teach us very interesting things I was asked why it is that domestic cats have got vertical slit eyes where large cats like lions and tigers and leopards have got round eyes and the answer I gave seems to be incorrect. The answer I gave was those smaller cats are more nocturnal, so they need to have more light in their eyes. That seems to be incorrect. The answer seems to have something to do, just VMP, those aren't cheetah tracks, are they? No, they're way too small. Too small. Civet, maybe. Okay. Um, the answer seems to be quite the opposite, that those small cats are hunters, stalking hunters during the day or the night. So they will do both and they're normally, in fact almost universally, ambush predators. Where a lion and a leopard and a cheetah, well they're also kind of ambush predators but they hunt predominantly at night and they do quite a lot more chasing than they do pouncing. So that's the reason that I read about, thank you to whoever sent that through to me, I've forgotten who it was exactly, brilliant article I read. But the most fascinating thing about that article for me was the fact that if you look at some of the herbivores, most of the herbivores, their pupils are the, um, horizontally split. So they've got a sort of horizontally split pupil and what that does is apparently allows them greater um, field of view so they can see f further around a greater angle and interestingly when they put their heads down to graze of course you'd imagine that that vertical f pupil would then tilt and cut out some of their field of view but it doesn't their pupils can move up to 50 degrees so as they put their heads down the eye can change and maintain that vertical alignment so that they're able to keep an eye out for predators that might want to come and eat them now that is apparently something like 10 times more than the human eye is able to change. Our angle can change by about 5 degrees, theirs can change by about 50. I thought that was really fascinating. So this is the area that we're going to drive very, very slowly through. To see if we can find some tracks of the cheetah. Now Darlene, you have obviously seen a cheetah before, you've been watching them and you want to know they're the only cats in the world that use their tails to steer. What Darlene means everybody is that a cheetah of course can run at about 60 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour is 100 kilometers per hour which is obviously very fast. Oh, let's quickly go across to Scott, oh hang on, wait one second. Oh, there is a leopard at Juma Pan. I don't know where Scott is. Um, Kirsten, do you want me to go there or is Scott going? We're just going to 
Okay, I think Scott's quite close to the Juma Pan. There's a leopard there. So get on the Juma Dam cam and have a look there. Just while we're waiting to find out there, that's extremely exciting. I can go there, Kirsten. I'm on Zoe's, I'll be there now. All right, it's us, we're going to the Leopard. I'm going to drive there at a great speed. I think it's probably, oh, sorry, sorry about that, VM. Oh, the Mahindra's not quite as uh, maneuverable as those Land Rovers. Right, hold on tight, everyone. Don't spill your drinks, lift them off your lap and watch your heads. Okay, while we're driving along, a cheetah uses its tail to swing from side to side and it just helps it to steer when it's going at that great speed. Now the only other animal that I think does that is a snow leopard. A snow leopard has got a leap sort of from boulder to boulder and they move at great speed and I think they've got a very heavy tail that I think, I may be wrong, is used in a similar way. Right, we should be with that leopard within the next two minutes, depending on the Mahindra's performance and my ability not to drive us into a large tree. It is having a drink at the moment out of the pipe next to a buffalo. Please watch the Juma Dam cam. You can listen to my voice yakking along, but uh, swap over to that or load another feed if you're only looking at one feed. We'll wait for the Zoomy to do our job until we get there. Holding on to my hat. The Mahindra is a little bit like driving a speedboat. It does a sort of floating mo motion like this. The final control tells me that they think this is Karula. This is very exciting, of course. Oh dear, I'm bottoming out the suspension a bit there. Viam, you seem to be grinning, that's a good thing. Sometimes the cameramen go quite pale when you drive along the speed. There's also an aerial that we nearly lost. Still there, fear not. Kirsten tells me that still drinking right next to the buffalo. The buffalo's just chased the leopard. Oh dear, keep watching everyone. Um, oh, which way to go? I think we're gonna go straight across this clearing. Right, she's walking towards the wall. She should get just over the wall by the time we get there. Right, the Zumi is not filming her anymore. She is apparently going across the dam towards the dam wall. We're on quarantine clearings, 30 seconds until we get there. I hope you haven't spilt anything. Viam, you're still there. Well done. Watch the aerial. Amazing. One place that it could have got through, it got through. Brilliant. Okay, I can see a buffalo, two buffalo. There are the buffalo. Many more buffalo at the pan. I'm looking at the dam at the moment, seeing if I can spot the leopard. I think we'll go straight towards the dam wall, see if we can spot her from there. No, where are you, dear lady? I don't see her. Now, what she did last time I saw her was she walked day straight down through here. So we'll just watch carefully for her tracks, see if she hasn't come across through the spillway here. Don't see any tracks. Buffalo's looking this way. VMP, any anything on your side? Yeah. 
Of course, the leopard, despite having wonderfully sort of fairly obvious spots when you're actually looking at them, they can be almost impossible to spot if you're not looking directly at them. Oh dear, airy me. I'm just going to quickly ask Kirsten to try and give me an idea of whether she walked over the dam wall or towards the edge here. Watching the road carefully. Ah, no, I think she's gone. Okay, so we can't tell exactly where she went, I'm afraid. We, I can't see any tracks. We'll turn around here once we've had a look down the road. Okay, I can see no tracks here. We're going to go back up onto the road. And then I'm going to turn off and see if I can hear anything alarm calling. Like a bird. Sorry about that hairy ride, everybody, but we th I really think it would be very pleasant if we could see her. Of course, we can go back and search for the cheetah shortly if we don't find the leopard. So I think she's actually disappeared down through here. Scott is also on his way to come and help out. I'll just turn my radio up. Let's switch off here and try and listen. Of course, the Mahindra sounds not unlike a great bevy of tractors. There, monkey's alarm calling. Kirsten, are you sure she came this way? Monkeys are alarm calling from the front of the camp. Maybe she turned round. Monkeys are calling from over there. It's not impossible that they can still see her sort of in this area. I wondered if she didn't go to ground, perhaps in this bush here. I'm just going to look very carefully at the ground here. I can't see any tracks. The last time I saw her here, she walked over here, but the, the time before that, she lay down very close. You see, those buffalo are still looking around there. Yeah, they're still looking there. I think she's gone the other side of the dam there. Let's get across, look exactly where those buffalo are looking. I think that's going to give us a much better idea. Uh, uh. Hold on, VMP. So if the Zoomy is listening, Zoomy, try and find the buffalo and you can see one of them is horning. One of them is horning a piece of bush there across the way. Two of them are looking and the monkeys are alarm calling. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, we're actually not too far away from Drames and have joined in on the search for Karula. Where are you hiding? Now, um, James is just up on our left, so he's working a slightly different area to us, which is useful. And who knows where she could have gone? It would be useful to know if she did actually manage to have a drink of water, because if she didn't, I feel that she could be lying up nearby. Oh no, she had a long drink. That's the last thing we wanted to hear. Good for her though. At least she got what she wanted before the buffalo chased her off. And the dam cam where she got chased from is just behind us to the left. 
And apologies if I don't give you guys too much attention right now, but I'm scanning in every possible direction to try and get a glimpse of the Queen of Juma. Huh. It can be frustrating business having this damn cam. You get these wonderful updates only to have your dreams and hopes shattered shortly after the animal has disappeared. We have spent many a drive trying to track these animals down after being informed about their position unsuccessfully. Which is obviously not what we want. The lioness that we were with earlier, only about 500 meters down to our right, on the right-hand side of that riverbed, I wonder if this big old Cape Buffalo that's, well, there's one heading off on our left, and I wonder if he's not kind of marching after her. That would be very, that will be interesting. told that she disappeared just a minute after James arrived, so she could still be nearby. Go ahead, James. Sorry, we've lost battery, so we want, we're going to have to get back. But there's a monkey alarm calling from the camp here. A buffalo, I don't know, it looked like they were looking in the direction. You can see them moving now. I don't know where she's gone. Okay, copy, perfect. Thanks very much, James. I hadn't heard those monkeys, so that's very useful. I'll switch off and, and, and have a look around here now. Thank you. Showing poor old James having to abandon mission in such an exciting scenario just to change batteries, but that is the trials and tribulations of being involved in a live safari broadcast. Oh, hello, Mr. Buffalo. Shame, you've got a wound on your back. You can go first. Okay. Now again, thank you for the update regarding where you last saw her, which was down where the old waterhole camera used to be in those bushes around there. So we'll go back and have a look there. I just feel it's better to almost start the search a little bit further afield and, and then come back. Go ahead. Sounds like James is going to... I've fallen down the log in front of my vehicle. She's just behind that in the glory ticket. I'm going to have to go back to camp. Hey, well done, James. Thank you. <laughs> Once you get batteries, you can return. Seeing as though he found it, it's only fair that we offered for him to return if he would desire, if he feels that Karula's going to be his flavor for the afternoon. Failing that, he may decide to go and search for the cheetah instead, which he wasn't lucky enough to see this morning. Uh, afternoon, Abel. Karula's lying up, Jumadam. Uh, Juma, uh, in front of the camp here at Vuyatela. There's two Juma Wattles, can you believe it? Okay, one's on Cheetah we'll Plains and one is here. Yeah. Okay, copy. So you're taking a little bit of a shortcut. And this way we're gonna be able to get the best views of her. James, apologies if I didn't let you guys know exactly where she was. She is lying up in that thicket where you guys saw her going. So just as well, you guys kept an eye on her for us. Thank you very much. And she obviously didn't have enough to drink. Or she did and just decided that it was time to sleep in the shade. Time will tell. Fascinating, what a day it's been. Leopard, lion, and cheetah. So for those of you who are on the Sunrise Safari, you are doing very well. There's also a strong chance that a pack of wild dogs may come and visit a little bit later on this evening. They're lying up not too far north of our northern boundary. 
full of an Inyala that they consumed this morning. And what's great about this is that I think the buffalo on our right here is the last one to be leaving the waterhole. So if that is in fact the case, Well, I'm just told that there's still one wallowing in the pan, thanks, Kirst, that we cannot see from this low angle. But isn't this a wonderful low angle? They are colossal beasts. Look at the size of that neck. And we'll just make the most of this great low angle before we shoot across here and find Karula, who's lying up somewhere in those green bushes behind the buffalo now. Oxpeck is covered, or covering the hide of that buffalo, doing a great job in helping to glean off the parasites. Now, I think we're going to play a little game of spot the spotted cat. She's somewhere on our right. That is all I know. And another thing that I know is that the camouflage is remarkable. So, good luck everyone. The first spot person to spot her gets to, gets to do a rain dance that we need desperately this afternoon. Not sure if anyone's had any luck yet. Just gonna keep going along here for a bit. Any luck anyone? Any leopard here? Ah, I think Brian may be the winner of the rain dance. <laughs> Only kidding, Brian. <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you. Great, great stuff. And just like the lion, she too is panting away heavily, battling in this hot weather. But what's interesting is that leopards are more prone to moving in the heat of the day than lion. And more often than not, even in the hottest days of summer, leopards will move a little bit during the course of the day. And wouldn't it be wonderful to know where exactly she came from? And another thing that would be wonderful to know, if we do get a good view of her belly, which we don't have at the moment, is whether or not she's got any suckle marks. And we're not too sure what the status is regarding the one cub that was seen. There was one confirmed sighting a while back, probably two weeks ago. And then we extracted completely from that area where she knew she was denning and gave her space and time and didn't want to be involved in any way in helping other animals work out where that den was. And in that period, it appears she may have lost it or she may have moved elsewhere. There may have been more cubs as well, we don't know. So exciting times and when they're lying down it is the best time to try and get a view of those nursing rings. But I'm not sure if you guys can see, I certainly from this angle can't see anything. But hopefully as the afternoon unfolds we'll be able to work that out. Apologies if you could hear me slurping down some deliciously ice cold water, a, ce a celebration drink for finding the queen. Now, I wonder what a lot of you guys thought regarding how far she may have run. They are masters of disappearing and she didn't have to move too far away from those buffalo before she knew she was safe. Well, here's something interesting happening just at the waterhole. And even though some of you may be watching it on the damn cam, look at that. Ah, oh, the damn cam is on us. Hello. So you wouldn't have seen that. Just as well, we spotted the hippopotamus leaving the water. They've got ginormous jaws. Look at that muscle protruding from the side of its jaw. They're fascinating. It's looking a little bit bonier than normal. It's a supermodel hippo, more bony than fleshy. 
at the moment and very tough times for these animals and that's exactly why we're seeing it out the water right now and that's exactly why the first thing it's doing is feeding. It's going to be spending a lot of time trying to acquire the average is about 40 kilograms that they're looking for daily of grass which is a massive 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 salad and as you can see by the sparse vegetation at the moment especially grass he's gonna have to spend a lot of extra time searching that's the wonderful Vuotela camp in the background and imagine lounging on one of those deck chairs looking out onto this view great stuff So it's all happening around the water this afternoon and no surprises there. Not only is there not much food around for the vegetations, but there's not much water either. So we've been extremely lucky in a lot of regards this summer and that the game viewing has been easier than normal. Easier to see deeper into the vegetation. It's not as thick as it normally is. And the water holes are teeming with game, which is usually not the case in, in the summer months. There's usually water around every corner, puddles and roads, mud wallows, dams. <laughs> well, Linda, you... <laughs> seem to think that she's called the Queen of Juma because she's the Queen of Disappearing. And fair enough, I thought she was the Queen for other reasons. You, th you said that she was laughing at us while we were driving around hoping to find her. And wouldn't it be wonderful to know exactly what she was thinking? I guess we'll never get to the bottom of that. Come on, Karula, you can go for another drink if you want. We'll be more than happy with that, but if you want to just do up some ruffled fur after your buffalo attack. Feel free. The great view of that three-lobed back pad that's elevated above her head. Sadly, Brian is at full zoom here, so he can't get any closer. And as she manicures her body, and to make sure she's in good shape. And Joseph is interested to know how old is this lady. And I stand to be corrected in this boiling heat. My brain is battling to be certain of her age, but I'm confident that it is nine years old. Um, she must be turning 10 at some stage. I'm not sure how soon that is. But it could be March. Thank you, Kirsty, for swooping down to the rescue there. Um, so she's a, a medium-aged female, Joseph. She's, you could kind of in a way say she's in her prime. I guess different people have different uh, ideas of when a leopard is in her prime. Let me just move forward a tiny bit there, if, if we can. We're in luck. There we go, just to make the most of this while she is stationary and lying down. They can live up to 17, 18 years of age. I've heard rumors of leopardess even getting into their 20s, but like I say, that is a rumor, not confirmed. So 17, 18 years of age, here she comes. And I'm searching desperately to see if I can see suckle marks. Oof, I can see her nipples. But I cannot be certain if there's a nursing ring there. I can't see one nipple poking out. But inconclusive. And Joanne, you just said we need to try and find out whether there are nursing marks or not. Ugh. No luck though this time. If there are in fact the nursing marks of Joanne and everyone, that's great. It'll still be quite some time, though, before we can expect to start seeing any cubs, though. Again, we want to be as sensitive as possible, just as we have been, and not sneak. 
into her life sooner than ex sooner than we need. So I'm just going to move around again. Um, oh my! Sorry, Ellen. <laughs> um, Ellen is one of our leopard experts and I was way off with her age. It must be her daughter that's nine. Um, and she is in fact 12 years old. So still in her prime a little bit, you could say, but getting a little bit on the older edge. She's 12 in March. And thank you very much, Ellen, for that update. We are gonna get some incredible views of her now. Look at that. Now you'll probably find that she can smell the lion. And she's been around the block, so she knows how to avoid them, and she will be avoiding them at all costs. The wind, thankfully, is in her favor. It's blowing gently from the lion up towards her, and you'll find that she may be on extra high alert this afternoon with that sense of lion in the air. Interesting thing is that I have seen leopard who know full well that lion are there, they can actually see them. Taking chances, backing themselves, understanding that they are incredibly well camouflaged. I can even see a slight yellowish stain around her one nipple, but again, it's just not enough, enough to go on to confirm that she has been nursing cubs recently. Oh, it would be wonderful if we did know. But for now, I fear that the mystery, oh, the mystery is going to continue for a little bit longer for us. The other ways that we could try and establish whether or not she is in fact still lucky enough to have some cubs is if she keeps heading back into the same area to and fro if we find even just if we find tracks going to and from the same area we haven't been lucky enough to do that yet so again none of us are sure what to think we've obviously all had long debates A shame. Well, I've just got a report saying that it's evidently not just the battery on James and Andrew's camera that's causing trouble. So he might be stuck with us for a little bit longer than normal. But everything happens for a reason. This morning, David and myself were late getting out this morning and that was due to some tech issues we had to get alex our russian genius out of bed a little bit earlier than normal and even in his sleepy state he managed to crack the code fairly quickly and essentially though we we got out later than expected and that's what led us to find the cheetah so who knows maybe the same thing will happen again this afternoon and i've just got another message through saying that it sounds like they have solved the problem. So just like that, we're back on track. So they'll be about five or 10 minutes before they're back. So good news there. Ha <laughs> ha! Well, Safari Dean, you two steps ahead of us here. Yeah? And you are wondering if Karula can smell the cheetah. Um, I wonder. That would be incredible to know. It all depends on, I guess, where the cheetah did come from and where it did go once we lost visual of it. But I've got a feeling that she doesn't know where the cheetah is. And even if she did, she wouldn't be too perturbed by that fact. Even a leopardess, you may find, would stick up to a big male cheetah. Although I've seen very limited interactions with them, so I can't confirm that. 
She's staring directly in the direction of where those lines are, and I wonder if she can't even smell them from here. I'm, I'm fairly certain she can. It's just a matter of whether the wind is doing the right thing, which I think it is. And who knows, this may affect her decision as to where she heads now. Is she going to do a little scent mark here? It looks like she is, yeah. <laughs> well, James Richard, thank you for coming to the rescue and mentioning that she's just so close to our vehicle now. And mentioning that she doesn't look a day older than nine, my original false age for her. And aren't we so fortunate to be able to have Leopard moving that close to our vehicle unperturbed? It is an absolute privilege to see animals like this that are naturally so shy and elusive that are so relaxed with our vehicles. Very good. Oof. Hello, Rochelle, who's just 12 years old, and you'd like to know why exactly does Karula twitch her tail from side to side? And it's hard to be certain, Rochelle, exactly why she's doing it. She's probably doing it to kind of show some kind of emotional sign. It may be excitement. It may be that she's angry. Sometimes they'll hold their tail up high, which she may start doing now when they're walking through an open air. And that's almost like a surrender, saying to everyone, don't worry, guys. I'm not trying to hunt anything. There's a monkey that's just started alarm calling, and it's probably spotted her from a quarter of a mile away. I can't even see it, but I can just hear that it's so faint that it must be miles away. So now this might be a little bit of decision-making, Rochelle. Should I go left? Should I go, go right? Kind of like thinking while she's twitching her tail, and we may find as the monkeys start alarm calling more, other animals may start joining in, and she may start holding that tail up higher and higher, almost as a surrender. Well, what's interesting about that direction she's deciding to head in now is that this is the exact same direction that she has been seen heading a few times. And again, that just is something that, that we need to think about. If she heads back into the same area time and time again, that means there must be a good reason why she's going there. Hello to Rewired Port. And Great to have you with us. Are you interested to know if we're ever lucky enough to see leopards making kills on these live safaris or any animals, you know, with high action sightings? And yes, we do. We certainly do. Um, not as often as a lot of us would like to happen, but that's the way it goes. And guides may go for a couple of years without seeing a kill with their guests, and then all of a sudden, one week of absolute high intensity, there goes a bushbuck. Well done, Brian. <laughs> Barking as it leaps off and... We may hear Karula vocalize now in disgust. And it's something that we don't see very often, but because of the heat, because of these conditions, she may well let off a rasping call. Come on, please. Rewired port, that's a good example of how anything can happen at any moment, and she could well have been on the back of that bush buck. But a lot of the times the predators don't succeed. And actually it's about 80% of the time that their hunts are unsuccessful. As an average rule, so even though we see quite a lot of close stalks and attempted kills, a lot of what actually is successful happens after dark or when we're not around. Now that bushbuck alarming would definitely have got those lions heads up. So, oh, sorry. Um, that's something important to remember. It looks like she's just gonna go sniff around in that bush where the bushbuck left from. And I'm just gonna, you guys keep an eye on her. I'm trying to work out where these monkeys are to give you an idea of how far they can see. Because it is going to absolutely shock you. Ah, oh, they're too far for me to even see. They're somewhere up and around the Juma camp. 
probably sitting high up in a tree, which is their favorite position to sit when shouting at leopards, the best possible vantage point. But sadly, I can't see them. But just before we do leave here and loop ahead of her, I'll get Brian just to give an idea of where they're calling from. Seeing a leopard moving through a riverbed like this is one of the favorite things, or favorite settings to see them in. I just feel it's such a picturesque environment for them. Looks like she's going to scent Mark again. And that smells like buttered popcorn, hard to believe. Freshly buttered popcorn. So if you're ever driving through Africa and you smell freshly buttered popcorn and don't find a popcorn stand, you'll know what's caused that. Your leopard. Now the trees where the monkeys are alarming from are way across this open clearing. Somewhere around those dead trees, somewhere in and around there, there's some monkeys. I'm not sure if you've even been able to hear them. There's been a faint <coughs> coming from those trees. So very large distances. I remember the first time I ever got schooled into the distance a monkey can see. I was on a bushwalk with my guests. We had parked our vehicle under a marula tree in a big open clearing. And we're about a kilometer away from the vehicle, making our way back towards it, the end of the walk, when we... When we heard these monkeys alarm calling, they were quite close to us. I'm naturally looking all around our general area, trying to work out what they're shouting at and eventually gave up because couldn't find anything. Looks like she's just quenching her thirst in a little puddle here. This is quite interesting. I wouldn't have thought there was any water remaining in there. And... We continued our walk back towards the vehicle and there we found the leopard lying in the same marula tree that our car was seeking a shady refuge under, so we had to call another vehicle to come and collect us at the end of our walk. What are you doing sniffing about in here, Karula? Just want to try and get onto the other side of the small embankment. We are quite close to her and we don't want to get in her way. Not that I feel that's the case, but I also just want to see what she's doing sniffing around in there. Lynn, you're right. Um, she certainly does look like she can use a meal. Looking a little bit hungry, but maybe that's because she's been preoccupied looking after some babies. Let's at least hope that's the case. Not too sure what she was doing sniffing around there. She is slowly making her way back up towards us here. She can possibly smell something that's worth eating. And it's not only sight that leopards will use in order to find their prey. Hearing and smell are also very, very important factors for that. And apologies, rewired port. Um, I kind of got lost in all the action that was unfolding there. Um, but yes, we do see kills, and interestingly enough, the only kill of a leopard that we've ever captured was made by this lady right here. Not too far away from where we are now at the moment, actually. She caught and killed a tiny baby impala in front of us. The same baby impala who the night before was orphaned by the same leopard who caught her mother. So, it's tough out here. The day before that, this leopard lost her cub to a hyena. So it was uh, 24 hours of killing and carnage for everyone involved. to Steph, and you've asked a question that I'm not entirely sure how to answer. Um, so maybe somebody can help us with this. And 
you'd like to know exactly what the, the leopard scent mark is made up of. Is it the, kind of the same as their urine? Is it something different? And I'm not entirely sure. So, oh, there's a, a bush buck on a nyala that's alarm calling. It's just up ahead of her, it sounds like. And it's probably going to intensify as she gets closer. Yeah, it's in front of her. And I can just, maybe it was kudu, but I can just see a few tails bounding off into the distance. Brian had a valiant attempt at trying to get you a glimpse, but it was literally just one or two bobbing white tails running off into the distance, and they look to be like the tails of some Nyala. So the last time we tracked Karula, her, her path, she came directly along a little pathway that just runs up. There we go, here. She headed straight up here, and we didn't follow on foot. It's just interesting to know that she has been spending time in this area. Where exactly she went from the last point on the road behind us, I'm not too sure. Just going to give the guys a quick update on the radio regarding her movements now. Stations, Karula is mobile north from the dam wall. As she moves through thicker vegetation like this, what we're going to try our best to do is firstly follow the path of least resistance, which can make viewing a little bit sometimes tricky, but we want to try and be as sensitive as possible to both the vegetation as well as the animal. And we don't want to chase away any potential prey of hers. We don't want to drive over the wrong vegetation, so bear with me as we try and wiggle our way through this bush. It does get quite thick in the direction she's going, so we've got our work cut out for us. Now, some of you have mentioned concerns that we shouldn't be following at her, her at all because in case we, we find her cub. And I appreciate your guys' concern, I really, really do. Um, but what I can assure you is that the, the behavior and methods that we have chosen to adopt with this specific leopard, um, it is the first time we've had cubs around, um, is, is a very sensitive one. And there are many other camps in Africa that from the moment a den site is seen, they will put vehicles in there, maybe only one per drive, but from the day that that den site is found, they will put vehicles in there, and there have been many, many a success story with cubs making it to adulthood with that same practice. And I believe very, very strongly, and it's fact, actually, that leopards do lose a lot of their cubs, whether we're around or not. Otherwise, there'd be leopards around every corner. I mean, the mere fact that their population is low as it is in this area is testament to the fact that it's difficult to raise cubs. Her last two, she could well have had two litters last year that not one of us had an idea of. We didn't have an idea where the den site was. We didn't even have an idea that she had cubs, but in terms of leopard and their abilities, she could well have had two sets of litters last year that have both been killed. This current one now could already be, be gone. I mean, looking at her stomach now, it doesn't look like she's got suckle marks. She may have already lost those cubs, and I can assure you, it's not because we were viewing her. It's because there's a high mortality rate of these animals in the wild. Male leopards. Is she stalking a buffalo, or am I going crazy? That's a buffalo over there, that big dark patch. <laughs> she's just kind of like stuck into stealth mode. Who knows, maybe there's something small in here by that she's interested in. But trust me, guys, if I had any concern that we would put any of, any of the animals at any danger here, we, would, we wouldn't. We're going to avoid that at all costs. And once we establish that she may have, still have a cub, 
the first thing we will do is move out and at least just know what's going on. So I think it would be unwise and foolish just to assume that she's got a cub now and therefore leave her alone. If she was angry, she would let us know. Animals do have the ability to express their emotions just like we do. And trust me, they will do it when they feel the, necess the necessity to. So, thank you for your concerns. We appreciate your concerns. It puts a smile on my face to know that you guys are worried about her and her cubs. But trust me, we are here in the situation. We've been through this many times, or at least I have. And we are erring on the super, super, super sensitive side at the moment. British Columbia. You'd like to know the average kind of time that a leopardess can spend away from her cubs. And that's a tricky question to answer. And I guess zoos may be the ones who can provide the best. Well, even then, I mean, it's just, it's not realistic. So no, it, it wouldn't be a zoo. I mean, some people who have followed leopard cubs very closely and they are out there, like I say, it's, there's different ways to go about viewing these animals and different people are entitled to their different opinions and because some people may have followed den sites very very closely um, they may have better insights into that but what i can assure you is that 12 hours to 24 hours is very easy a very uh, likely time time frame that she will leave them for in order to find meals, the fundamental thing is that she needs to look after herself. We're going to continue following Karula as she waltzes through this herd of buffalo. And as soon as we get another good view, we will call you back to us. So, I'm sorry about that, everybody, that we disappeared. I think actually it was a very good thing because I'm not sure that this uh, well, very large and unmaneuverable vehicle would have been able to do what Scott has done with Rusty. Now, that, of course, is not a leopard, it is not a cheetah, it is not even a turkey. It is a ground hornbill, an extremely endangered bird of southern Africa. And this fellow has been on his own now, probably for about a week. We've been watching him on and off. And I heard him calling lonelily the other morning on his own. Normally it's a duet between a male and a female where the male goes, oh, oh, and the female goes, oh, 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 and the male goes, oh, oh, and the female goes, oh, 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 oh. But this time it was just the mournful, oh, 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 as he tries to find himself a mate and a flock. So normally they're in a flock, and perhaps he's just a just about an adult and trying to find a flock of his own. Let me roll slowly forward. I might actually mm, I'm gonna stop let me stop here actually. No, he's going to put himself between, at least behind the tree, so that he cannot be seen by us. That's very clever they do that, of course, on purpose. Because we have this super zoom, I'm not going to try and drive off road for him. There we go. We'll try and find something nice to eat there. They're completely carnivorous. And the oh, and they're obviously his bowels are working very well there. That's excellent to see that he's uh, eating food, sufficient fiber to make his bowels function. You still see him, Viam? Now reaching the end of the reach of my spine. Okay. Right, we're going to carry on looking for the cheetah. Let's head back to the other spotted cat with Scott. Now, this must, may not be the view you were hoping to come back to, but what's interesting is that you've got a great view of her tail that Brian's making the most out of, and there's also a chance that we're going to get you a two shot of two of Africa's big five the leopard and the Cape buffalo. Well, there we go, Brian's banking a good one now. 
but she's heading in their direction and kind of, they don't have a clue that she's here. They haven't huffed or puffed or looked in her direction once. So she's just slinking straight in and amongst them. There's quite a few further to the left of where you can see the one now. And here she goes, this is what I was hoping for. Not the best view of the buffalo, but we're gonna keep the leopard as our priority now, I think. Richards, I couldn't agree more with you. This abnormally dry summer weather is making her blending in a lot easier than it would be in the summer. I find that they do stick out quite a lot more in the summer months when there's a very dark contrasting green coloration. They still blend in well, of course, but I certainly think the dry months are the most effective months with regards to camouflage. Well, it feels like we may have picked up a little stowaway. That didn't sound good. I'm just gonna jump out, which may seem ludicrous, and just see what we're dealing with. But don't worry, we've got this. That, that is interesting, what we've got going on down here. We've picked up a, looks like it could be a leadwood log, and it's got a network of roots that have stuck out and kind of got caught in the undercarriage of the car. Um, so what I'm gonna suggest doing is probably sending you back to James while Brian and I work out how we're gonna bush mechanic our way out of this one. Um, so goodbye from me for now, and we will see you guys uh, in, a, in a few moments. <laughs> I knew that was a very good decision of mine not to go uh, after Karula in this car. Poor old Scott has now lodged himself seemingly on a rock or a log. I'm sure he'll get rusty off eventually, but at least we have had a magnificent sighting of Karula. So I just want to quickly tell you how I managed to spot her. I just had a feeling, because we hadn't had any tracks of her going away, and then Scott said, he said, I bet she's lying here somewhere. I heard him say it. I bet she's lying around here somewhere because she hasn't finished her drink yet. And I just thought, let me look behind that worry bush because I've seen her lying there before after she was chased off by buffalo. And sure as nuts, I looked over the edge of the log and there was the beautiful golden pelage of Karula, the peaceful one. So we are now heading back towards where she was, the cheetah was last seen. I just was checking around where that ground hornbill was simply because that is where it, there's a big clearing there. And cheetah, of course, like to be around clearings. They like to sit on the fringes of clearings, sometimes on a termite mound. But apparently that cheetah that from this morning had eaten a great deal already. And so it's probably not looking to try and eat anything just yet. So maybe headed down towards Treehouse Dam for a little bit of a drink. There is still that puddle of water there that keeps replenishing itself from the underground flow. So perhaps that's where he's gone, but who knows? What we did pick up, Viam got out the car and picked up a, a feather from the ground hornbill. And we'll just quickly show it to you now. It is quite astonishing. It fell out just before you came live with us. Look at the size of that feather. Isn't that unbelievable? Viam, was that must have been out of a wing. That's a wing primary, I think. Isn't that astonishing? Brilliant. And you can see how it's worn down here at the base. And so when a bird molts, it'll get rid of these flight feathers so that they can be replaced and the bird can remain in flight. Marvelous. Hello, Anne T. Lope. Nice to hear from you again. You want to know how many ground hornbills are left in the wild? Anne T. Lope, as far as I'm aware, 
I think only about 2,000, but I could be wrong. I'm not actually sure, but that seems to be the last figure that I remember hearing. Birds are obviously a bit more difficult to keep tabs on than are the mammals, but the Ground Hornbill Research Group is certainly a very vast and relatively well-funded wildlife NGO, and so I think they've probably got a pretty good handle on how many there are. Now this is exactly the kind of place we want to be, just scouring the landscape carefully to see what we can find. Viam will be doing the same. The last time I was in this area, we had Tingana lying under a tree here. And Jeffrey in Texas, I agree with you. I mean, if you were watching this show for the first time or you'd been watching for a few weeks and I told you that that rare bird was endangered and we hardly ever see them, you'd probably say I was lying to you simply because we see them relatively often. And Jeffrey, you say, of course, that we're so lucky to see such an endangered bird so frequently. Absolutely, we are. Now, the other thing you want to look out for while we're driving along here is on the termite mounds, of course, a cheetah will lie and they're brilliantly designed so that they can lie sideways with their heads kind of upwards. So if you imagine lying on your side, twisting your head 90 degrees and being able to look upwards over your shoulder on a more, more sort of permanent basis, you can imagine how uncomfortable you would be. Now a cheetah, because it has to keep looking out for things that might want to attack it, or perhaps antelope walking past the termite mound where it's hiding can flatten its body against the ground and just lift the head up and look almost 100, probably 270 degrees around without moving the body. It's a very clever design, but it also means that they're quite difficult to spot. So very slowly driving down here. And of course, normal summer vegetation would make this very difficult indeed. Now, there's some zebra in there. Be, just, they look like they were looking at something. Well, I mean, they can hardly avoid looking at anything unless their eyes are shut. But let's just keep looking there. And I'm just scouring the termite mounds around at the base there. See if there isn't a yellow and black spotted pelage. Okay, Karula, I think, is going to disappear into the bush. I'm not sure what Scott's status is. Let's nip back to him and see what happens. Welcome back, everyone. And we've got a flat tire, um, but we're going to be able to ride on it for a little bit. It's not completely flat. Um, so we've still got a little bit of time to get you a few more glimpses of Karula. But sadly, this puncture is going to mean we're going to have to leave her behind. But we, like I said, at least should be able to get you some good last views of her. And of course, we're going to try and change our tire as quickly as possible and catch up to her again. And Matty, my good friend who is just nine years old, is wondering whether the leopard is safe or whether she's heading towards the lion. And don't worry, Matty, she is heading away from them. So she doesn't have to worry about racing up a tree if they start chasing her. So that's the good news. The only bad news is that we've got a flat tire. Can you absolutely believe our luck? But everything does happen for a reason. Just like I said earlier, the tech issues that James was facing. OK, well, now that we've lost visual, we're going to send you away so that we can change this tire as quickly as possible. And who knows, maybe, just maybe, we will be able to find her again. So goodbye. Good luck, and hopefully this tire. Well, at least we got a good view of her, everyone. Sorry about Scott's tire. I think that might be the first time that Rusty's actually had a puncture. The tires on Rusty look pretty indestructible. So he must have hit something pretty hard. Something must have snuck up on him. 
as he drove through that drainage line, probably perforated the side wall of the tyre. I obviously haven't found the cheetah yet. This is quite a nice shot. I'm just going to keep turning off just to see if we can get some alarm calls. Um, VMP, there's a fork-tailed drongo up there. And we were talking about the fork-tailed drongo a little earlier. He's in the sort of, it's, he's in the knobthorn behind the scotia and just hanging in a very thin branch there. Can you see him? No? No? Okay, well, uh, let me try and explain. If you f go up the knobthorn's trunk, right? There, he's flown away. Yes, it's not great when he flies away there. There, have you got him there? Right, so fork-tailed Drongo. Now you can see him with his forked tail. And a forked-tailed Drongo will normally be following a large herbivore in order to eat the invertebrates that it kicks up. Now I'm just listening carefully for any kind of alarm call. Can't hear anything at this stage except the gentle wind blowing out of the southeast. The sun mercifully hidden by a lying cloud. Right, I think that's enough drongo, don't you? <laughs> oh, Darlene, now you're in New Hampshire. I'm obviously not making myself clear enough. You're saying if I'm listening for the cheetah, what sound do they make that I'm listening for? Uh, Darlene, I'm not listening for the cheetah. The cheetah will be completely silent. I'm listening for things that might be alarm calling at the cheetah. Squirrels, dwarf mongoose, some of the birds. They might well alarm call at a cheetah if they saw one. Um, a cheetah itself is silent unless it is trying to call its youngsters. And then they make like a chirruping sound, like a bird. It's an amazing sound. It's so totally uncat like. But they do, um, they purr if they're very satisfied. Unlike the other big cats, they will make a sort of purring sound, which is very, uh, well, it's charming really. And they, that's about it really. I don't think they make too many other angry sounds. They can growl but not in that blood-curdling way that the lions and leopards and tigers can. They've got a very different kind of vocal setup. So li literally, they sound like a chirping bird when they're calling the youngsters. So we've done what we call Finns Road, and we're now heading towards the dam. Now, we were chatting extensively yesterday while we were watching the lions eating that buffalo. We talked about lions and their ability to scavenge and hyenas and their ability to scavenge. And James Taylor, you want to know if uh, cheetah will do the same thing. Will they eat rotten meat? Will they scavenge? No. Most of the time, they won't. Can they eat rotten meat? Yes, probably they can and survive quite happily. Remember, cheetahs are right at the bottom of the predator hierarchy out here. They rank lower than lions, hyenas, leopards, and wild dogs, not in that order. The order would be lions, hyenas, wild dogs, leopards, and then cheetah, somewhere way down below. So the reason they probably don't scavenge as much as they might is because they will, I mean, they'll be chased off kills even by jackals. They'll be chased off kills by vultures. So it's really very easy indeed for other animals to steal from a cheetah. And so very difficult likewise for them to try and steal from other animals that have killed. Nice question, thank you. So they do do most of their own killing on their own. I can see no tracks of this fellow. But we'll keep looking of course. Lots of questions about the names of animals here today. And Rochelle, you're in London. You want to know why the cheetahs don't have names? Simply because we don't see them enough. Uh, we, the last cheetah we saw was seven months ago. We don't know if this is the same cheetah, if this cheetah's ever been here before. They're not territorial, especially in the presence of other predators. So we don't know this cheetah well enough to give it a name yet. We don't know if we'll ever see it again. We don't know if the next cheetah that comes onto the reserve will be the same one. It's almost impossible, so it's pointless naming them. 
The dam is just down here. The junction it was last seen is just up there, so it's quite possible that he would have crossed, he or she, I don't know if it was a he or a she, would have crossed in front of us. We'll head towards the dam and see. Now, of course, we don't have a tracking team out at the moment, simply because we're only on, well, this is the tracking vehicle we're on. So while Brent Leo Smith, who's not on drive, would probably normally be out scouring the landscape as well, on foot looking for the cheetah, we're on our own. So I need your help, please. Keep looking on top of the termite mounds. See what else we can see. Now the reason I'm so excited about seeing cheetah, of course, is because the last time we saw one was seven months ago. That is a long time. And they too are endangered. Not quite as endangered as wild dogs, but they are certainly endangered. And I think they have some wonderful stories about them. You know, cheetah, Genghis Khan used to keep a stable of cheetah for hunting. They can be imminently domesticated, although they don't breed very well in captivity. In fact, they breed very badly. But they can be, if you raise a cheetah from birth, they can become very tame completely comfortable around human beings and a bit like a wild dog if they're used to people you can actually follow them on the hunt you can walk with them and they won't pay you any attention but you'll never get the same response from lions or leopards in the wild so I just think they're very special animals and I wish we saw more of them but in the presence of so many hyenas lots of lion activity around here that's why we don't see them that often very astute question coming through from Shannon in Ohio. And Shannon, you want to know if cheetah would walk on the road like the other predators do? Yes, but less, Shannon. It's a very good question. They would, but they would walk much less on the road, I think, than other animals would, simply because they want to stay undetected far more than leopards or lions or hyenas. Right, I'm going to drive very, very slowly up to the dam now. Just quick checking under every bush, checking the top of every termite mound. Might find the recalcitrant cat having a drink as we speak, but no, nothing at the dam at the moment. Hmm. Now, Eggy, another astute question. You're wondering about Karula's cubs, if she still has them, and would a cheetah pose a threat? Eggy, a cheetah would not, simply because the cheetah would not be walking in the drainage line where Karula would be hiding her cubs. I'm just uh, let's stop and have a listen here. And so while if a cheetah came across a leopard cub on its own in the open, I think it would almost certainly kill that leopard cub. The chances of it finding leopards in their den are so remote that I really don't think there would be any danger at all to Karula's cubs if they are still extant. Completely silent again. It is amazing. Just listen for 10 seconds. Just the buzzing of the flies. Isn't that amazing? And I'm sure it's because of the lack of water. I think normally around this time of the evening, as the day started to ebb away, so the birds would start to sing. But they're not doing that now. All right, let's carry on. <laughs> uh, 
Hello, James. Richard, you say we need Jamie to get back from leave so that she can say the word cheetah and we would see it. Now, for those of you who don't know what James Richard is talking about, Jamie basically was just calling in animals on tap. She'd decide what she wanted to see, say the name of the cat and or the dog, and it would appear at will. And so, yes, James Richard, maybe it's time to give her a Skype call. I'm sure Brent Leo Smith is doing that on a daily basis. So we'll get here. Let's first see, before we call her back from leave, let's just see if it will work at a distance. Perhaps we can get her to call from a distance. I'm going to drive now back up towards the clearings at the edge of the road that we were driving on, the edge of Zoe's Road, and see if we don't have any luck there. It was quite a hot day, so look, the cheetah wouldn't have moved a great deal, but it would have done a little bit of moving around. I just love getting astute questions, especially from our younger viewers. And Brooklyn, your age, just 10. And you ask a very clever question. Would a cheetah be able to kill a zebra? Not a full-grown zebra, no, Brooklyn. Would they take a foal? Yes, they could take a foal. And I'm sure they have at various stages. I've never seen it myself. But yes, they could take a small foal. So about the largest adult prey that they could take would be about an impala size. Even a, I mean, on their own. So sometimes they form coalitions. The males will form coalitions, especially if they're brothers. And then they do take down larger prey, sometimes up to the size of a wildebeest. I think a zebra might still prove slightly too much for them most of the time, though. Lovely question. Thank you, Brooklyn. Aged just 10. Very good question. Of course, the man who travels more around the world than anyone else is Mr. Moustache, who is now away from Michigan and back in Iceland. Mr. Moustache, do tell us what you're doing. Are you a spy, perhaps um, an assassin who's hiding out there? I'd be fascinated to know why it is that you and Mrs. Moustache, who I'm reliably informed is uh, mercifully not blessed with facial hair, I'd love to, you to tell us what, what it is that you do, that you have to be in these freezing cold places while you're watching your hot safaris. Anyway, you want to know what the structural differences between a cheetah and a leopard are. Very nice structural differences and very interesting ones. The first would be the size of the skull. A leopard, of course, has a massive skull. And by massive, I don't mean huge. I mean big in relation to the rest of its body. It has enormous front teeth. It's got muscles that uh, come off the top of the head, which give it very powerful jaws. And that's because when it kills its prey, it normally does it with a one really vicious bite to the back of the neck or a choke hold. Now, a cheetah has a much smaller skull, and it has a much smaller skull because it needs to have, it's, it's completely over-specialized. It's over-specialized to run at great speed, and so it's got the smallest head possible to allow for lightness. It's got much smaller canines, top canines, so that it can open up the nasal passages to suck in the amount of oxygen that it needs in order to, to run and move at great speed and produce the energy that it needs. No other cat has got the same size nostrils, but that means that it has to sacrifice size in the canines. So those are the sort of head differences. It doesn't have nearly as powerful a bite as a leopard does. And so it will have to kill with a choke hold. It won't be able to grab an animal at the back of the head and kind of snap the spinal column, which is the idea behind a leopard, especially with the smaller prey that it has. And then, of course, a leopard is stocky. A leopard is built a little bit like a... Um, like a what? Like a pit bull. Like a pit bull, yes, I suppose it is built a bit like a pit bull. It's meant for very short bursts of extremely powerful speed. And 
you know, I don't think when a when a, a leopard hits an impala or a steenbok or a diker, I don't think they know what's hit them. I think it comes so fast, they leap in at such an incredible speed, do what they have to do, you know, kind of tear and rip and bite so fast that I don't think the animal knows what's happened half the time. A cheetah cannot do that. They are much more slight. And they're slight not because they're not strong, but because it allows for greater flexibility. So a cheetah's spine can bend at the most incredible angles. You watch them run. There's a wonderful video that has been doing the rounds. I think it's a BBC shot video where they've got a cheetah and they're actually driving next to it. Somehow they're keeping up with this thing. But you can see how its spine bends and unfurls and bends and unfurls as it runs. Its back legs arm step way in front of its front legs as it explodes forward into the next stride. So it doesn't have the same kind of explosive muscle, musculature that a leopard does, but it is incredibly flex flexible. And then the, I suppose the last structural difference would be the tail. And the tail of a cheetah is thick and heavy. We were chatting about that earlier. And it's thick and heavy because it needs that tail to sway from side to side when it's chasing something like a Thompson's gazelle, which is slower than it, but can definitely change direction at an incredible speed. Leopard doesn't need that heavy tail because it doesn't change direction when it's chasing something. It doesn't chase. It stalks up to very close and then very short burst of speed. So, Mr. Moustache, International Man of Mystery, that is my tree tires on the different uh, structure of the cheetah and the leopard. I have seen no further tracks. Well, I haven't seen one track, to be honest. Very, and we're having a day full of very astute questions today, and it's keeping me on my toes. Thank you, Jilly. You're in York, in the United Kingdom, the North Country, and you are wondering why, if a cheetah doesn't want to be seen, why wouldn't it move in the drainage lines and the dry streams? Well, Jilly, that's a very good question, but the answer I think lies in the fact that. All predators are on the lookout for something to eat all the time, which means that if a, uh, so a leopard, it's a perfect place for a leopard to be because it can remain concealed, and if something comes along, it can just lie down and pounce on it, whereas a cheetah, of course, needs to be able to run. So it's going to take every opportunity to be in an area where, say like this, if it was walking through the bush here, it would go from tree to tree, but stay within an area that it knows it can run through should the need arise. So that would be my, my guess. It's not to say that cheetahs never walk in drainage lines, but should they see something that they wish to kill, it will be pretty difficult for them in a drainage line. I have seen no tracks at all. Wonderful question. Dylan, you're in Iowa, and I was talking about Genghis Khan earlier and his stable of cheetah. And Dylan, you want to know if any tribes of Africa use cheetah to hunt with as they are used in Saudi Arabia sometimes. No, they don't. Cheetah were never domesticated in Africa, which is quite interesting. No, none of the large game here was domesticated. And I mean, I think, I think cheetah are not easy to domesticate. But no, they haven't been domesticated here, and so none of the tribes that I know of have ever used cheetah to hunt with. Good question. Cheetah, of course, used to be distributed throughout the, I think, that what they would call the, uh, what it would have been the Palearctic, which is Eurasia, and also probably the Afri Afro-Tropical region, which would be where we are. And. I think combined they're called the Paleotropic region. So all the way through Africa, up into Arabia, across to India, and possibly down uh, in some parts of Russia, maybe Mongolia and even China, I would imagine. Them days is well over, though. To the extent that they think that all cheetah are descended probably from three females. All current cheetah descended from just three females.
and that's called a genetic bottleneck. For those of you who are worrying about that sort of thing. Now, we are heading towards a beautiful viewpoint, and um, we're just going to stop here briefly. Vimpi, there is a stern book, which of course would very much enjoy not seeing a cheetah today. A cheetah would devour a stern book very quickly. Little stern book. And being pretty confiding, we don't often see them like this. Of course, they normally do what this one's partner did, which was run off. Difficult, difficult time for the stern book now. They are concentrate feeders. They'll be needing things like underground roots and um, new shoots. No new shoots on the leaves. No new shoots on the twigs. So very difficult times ahead for the stern book. Okay, Scott is back up and running. I'm not sure what his plans are. I think he's probably going to try and refine that leopard. So let's head across to him, find out what his uh, idea for the afternoon is. I'm going to keep going down here and see if we can't pick up some tracks of the cheetah. So, welcome back. We had <laughs> one of the longest uh, tire changes ever recorded on the planet of the Earth because we lacked the one spanner that we needed. Um, so that is my excuse. Brian and I are Formula One pit quality tire changers, just so that you guys all know. We just need the right tools. Now, Karula was last on our left, about 100 meters behind us is where we left her, and she was heading parallel to this road that we're driving down now, but she had been tending in its direction. So she's been tending in a north and slightly east, which is that direction. Um, she's been heading in a north and easterly direction. And that's why I'm creeping along this road as slowly as possible. She could have covered a long distance. She could be long gone. If she had have carried on at the speed that she was moving when we were with her, we've got some ground to catch up. But we can't be certain that, that she has done that. And rather than racing ahead, I'm hoping to drive slowly and maybe, just maybe, find some tracks of her crossing this road. Not gonna be easy, but it's a possibility. And look what we found. Or what found us, rather. Nothing like looking for leopard and finding an elephant. Is this young bull going to give us some attitude? I feel like he's thinking about it. He's got a bit of a swagger in his step. Hello, boy. Are you going to make us shake in our boots? Come on. Come on, give us the fright of our lives. Nope. You pity us. Thank you. Oh, maybe not. Isn't it wonderful the way they lift their noses up to increase? Yes. The <laughs> sense of your smell. Sorry. Look at this big mother coming to make sure everything's okay. And is it that she's going to give it attitude or us attitude? She's an old lady. Look at how gaunt her jaws are. And is she responding to a cry of her youngster? This could well be one of her offspring that she was just making sure is safe. Elephant don't have good eyesight, so even though she may be aware, she's well aware that we are here, she would have heard us, smelt us, she wouldn't necessarily be certain of what that trumpet was all about. And like I've said, she's an old lady. Look at those temporal dents. Oof. And you may find that she's also leaking from those temporal glands, just below those deep temporal dents, which is an emotional indicator and one that we need to take heed of. But rather than racing off, I'm just going to stay where we are and let them make the decision about where to go. Now, a big reason why she may be extra gaunt at this time of the year, and you'll find a lot of the older elephants really showing signs of the drought, and that is because there's 
probably not nearly as much soft vegetation around as there normally would be in a regular summer. And because once they get old, they don't have very effective molars, they either become blunt or non-existent, they really battle to chew their food and process enough food. So that could be what's causing her to be so thin and gaunt. Wasn't it wonderful the way she responded absolutely immediately without battering an island? She came flying in to make sure her youngster was okay. Apologies. I just needed to quench my thirst again. Whew. That tire changing got Brian and myself fairly sweaty. Nice little mid safari workouts. Wonderful. Just glancing back to make sure Kula hasn't crossed behind us and no sign of her doing that. So let's continue along. She may have just been skirting parallel to this road to avoid being detected in a wide open clearing that she would have had to walk across to get to the right. Or she may have already crossed over. Dike being killed. Kula's caught a dike in there. Okay. That's so frustrating. <laughs> we can't get a vehicle in here. I mean, we can try. How far up are we now? We're too far up. You can only drive so far up this riverbed. I'm not sure if you guys did hear that, but there was a, a squealing. <coughs> and well done, Brian, because he initially heard it and pointed it out to me. And it is the telltale squeal of a diker, possibly a steenbuck, once they've been caught. So at least we know Karuna has got a meal. We're just not going to be able to see any of the action. Ah! And it's not going to be the first time a leopard's actually... No. Oh, no, I didn't. Uh, what's wrong with my earpiece? OK. OK, we need to turn around, and we are in a rush. Because there's a cheetah close to us. I'm not sure where James is, but it's a race to get there. everyone. Just making sure we've got everything. We're in one piece. Well, Karuna just made a kill. Good news. Thank heavens the cheetah's just been found because I was about to pull my hair out knowing what she was going to be doing in there but not being able to do anything about it. Now we're not far away. We're probably only two minutes away from Inga's house. And if you just don't mind letting Nikki know that maybe we'll be able to pick her up on the way past or at some point so she can just wait by the gates. I'm guessing that that message could well have come from either Nikki or Brent. Kirsty, if you also don't mind just keeping on speaking to me, I'm not sure my ear pieces stop working. Or Brian can maybe just relay things to me as need be. Okay. Shots. Ah, <laughs> but no problem because Brian can relay all the important information to me. Um, I just sort of like, can you hear that? Why aren't you doing anything? Because he's obviously hearing Cheetah and Inga's house, and I'm going on about Karuna that we can't see. So Brian is obviously questioning my sanity for a moment. We're going to do the trap, Victor. Can you believe it? Lion, leopard, and cheetah all in one drive. Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves because we haven't got to the cheetah yet. But I am the master of counting the eggs before they hatch. So forgive me for that. OK, we're nearly there. We're 30 seconds away, guys. 30 seconds and about 44 more bumps and we'll be there. This is going to be the bumpiest of the bumps. We're hacking up quite a few here. Oh, Brian's getting the worst treatments out of everyone. Oh, what would 
be nice is if James does still come into the area because there are such few fast moving animals, because there is a chance it may exhibit that incredible speed for us. We should definitely make sure we've got as many of us in the sighting as possible. Okay. I'm looking for Brent, like up a tree or something, giving directions. I'm not still not sure who Kirsty's getting these updates from. Chasing Impala. Yeah, I don't know about the Chasing Impala space Well done, guys. Thank you. We're going for the trifecta, lion, leopard, and cheetah. So it was hunting Impala, but sadly in the wrong direction, into this thicket as opposed to into the open clearing. The fastest mammal on earth that may well have covered quite some distance already. Who knows, maybe he's caught one in here. Whew so there we go. I did count the uh, eggs before they've hatched, and now I'm facing the repercussions thereof. suggesting James I don't know I think possibly uh, depending on where he's coming from should possibly do Rebecca's Road there is a chance that the cheetah could pop out there it's just off to our right um, it's so tricky because it is thick in here but we will be able to get a vehicle in here um, so if James just gets a hold of me on the game drive channel then I can have a chat with him and, and work things out um, if not, he can even just go onto this channel, Kirst. I'll just chat with him. Um, what I'm going to try and do, there's a little spot where we can sneak into the small kind of clearing off to our right here. And that may produce the goods for us. James, I'm going to wiggle into the bush between... Uh, the Rebecca's drainage and Philemon's dip. He chased Impala south uh, down the western side of Philemon's dip, basically. Be nice. I'll come from the other side on Rebecca's. The... It's always such a gamble. I mean, they move so quickly, these animals, that it could have gone in any direction over that road they're going to be covering probably 20 to 25 meters in the air without hitting the ground so he could easily have just crossed the road without even leaving a track behind he could also very well have caught an impala and could just be suffocating it right ahead of us here somewhere so the options are essentially endless as to where he could be and all we've got to do is keep as focused as possible and hope we get lucky. Can you believe that? Within a, a minute of a leopard making a kill, that's a confirmed kill that Karula made. She definitely caught a hold of that diker or steenbuck. This cheetah may well have also made a kill. But no guarantees. I fear that now we're heading a little bit too far west away from where we actually, well, where, where at least Brent saw, her, uh, saw him. 
But maybe we'll, we'll make our way back there. The Inkuhuma Pride killed that buffalo not too long ago, just up ahead of us here. Um, and that may give you, some of you guys, an idea of how much further west we've come down from where we saw Brent at the top of Philemon's Dip there. Shoo-wee. Shoo-up, shoo-up. Happy to hear everyone enjoyed racing around Juma. At least we had a valid excuse to put the pedal to the metal. But like I say, and you would think after having been caught in this trap so many times that I would have learned by now, to not get too excited about a sighting before you get there, but I just couldn't resist. What's interesting is that if this cheetah had have actually caught an impala, we, we could still be in the scenario where that impala is not dead and the cheetah is still suffocating it, which will help us. Or the impala itself will help us. What can you guys see? Where's the cheetah? Like you guys are on a jolly holiday here, and you haven't moved very far at all. Hmm. Which is making me wonder: Has the cheetah not taken on an impala somewhere close by to us here? Maybe the impala that was at the back of the fleeing crowd, and that's why these ones have kind of like looked back, can't see anything, not sure what's happened, and therefore. No major commotion. So that is possible. The cheetah may have targeted one, chased it off in one direction, and that's why these guys are kind of standing around like, oh, what just happened? What was that? They're running after us at incredible speeds, speeds that they probably haven't seen being exerted very often, because you don't see a cheetah here very often. Costin, and you'd like to know just how long this cheetah may have exerted its top speed for? Um, probably not, not any longer than a minute would, would be my guess. But I've hardly watched these animals in action, so I'm not, I'm not too sure. But, but far longer than a lot of your, your predators would normally chase for. Release your cats. Leopard and lion are usually ambush hunters, although having said that, the Inkuhuma pride chased the buffalo for about half a mile before they caught it in this dip here, that story I just told you about now. So there are always exceptions to the rule, but generally not much more than a minute. I would, I would say it would be a cheetah's maximum period of top exertion. I'd love to know the story behind how Brent and Nikki managed to find the cheetah. Were they just going on a stroll around quarantine, or did they hear some impala alarm calling, or did they smell the cheetah with an incredible pair of nostrils? Who knows? They 
Jones, no luck in the block here. I'm probably going to get back onto Philemon's dip and stick to the roads and just loop around. That last direction, like I said, was apparently south down the western side of Philemon's dip. We'll be on Rebecca's now. Be. Okay, well, James is in a good spot. He's just to the east of us. Hello to Sabrina, just 12 years old in North Carolina. And somebody has told you that hyena can run faster than cheetah. If I'm hearing correctly. Um, but whoever told you that, Sabrina, is not entirely sure what they are talking about. Maybe they mean something else, like maybe that hyena can run for longer periods of time, further longer distances. Can you see that there, Brian? Is that a steenbuck lying down? <laughs> I think it. Oh, uh, uh, well spotted. I thought I saw it was a, a steenbuck or some kind of a carcass lying down, but it was just a termite mound and a stick there. Well done, Brian. So, Sabrina, I think what they could have meant is that hyena can run for much further. They're like a marathon runner, long distance runner, not a sprinter. So maybe that's what the book or the person who ever told you that meant. But the cheetah is for sure, Sabrina, it is the fastest mammal on Earth. There is no faster mammal than that. Actually, animal on Earth, except for there's a bird that can travel at faster speeds than it, a peregrine falcon, and it can travel up to incredible speeds of hundreds and hundreds of kilometers an hour as it turns itself into a teardrop shape and just falls out the sky. Straight down. That's the only animal that can move faster than a cheetah, but it's a little bit different because it's just relying on the ability to fall out the sky to move quickly as opposed to make that speed itself like the cheetah does. Okay, well, we've just got a message through from Ranger Nicola Austin. And they've let us know how they found the cheetah. They apparently heard squirrels and impala shouting absolutely wildly at this apex predator. And that's what caused them to leave the comfort of Inga's house, where some of us stay. We've just passed the two impala. Brian's waving across at Andrew and James. They're just across the valley there. We're not going to stop to show them to you because there's not much to see. And we would rather focus on trying to find this cheetah. Like I said, there's two impala just behind us. Oh, yeah, we've got its tracks here. Am I dreaming? No, apologies. Apologies, everyone. There's me counting my eggs again. I thought I had seen its tracks, but on closer inspection, they appeared to be that of a hyena. Places to check now to help us try and find him is up on termite bounds. That's where we found him sleeping this morning. And I can only actually see half of his head when we first saw him this morning. Um, Beautiful sunset that Brown is showing you there. So there, there was a, just kind of his half of his head sticking out of a termite mound and saw a telltale twitch of the ear. Good, we're gonna send you across to James for an update on his side of the valley. Hopefully you guys get lucky. Um, James deserves it after finding Karula, of course. So that'll be nice for him to get a glimpse of this cheetah. And over you go.
Now, got off the vehicle here because it's very thick and can't come driving in here. Um, but there was some babblers alarm calling just over the edge here and VM heard something crunching in the bush. It's not ideal habitat for a cheetah. I think perhaps if the cheetah is here, it would be just moving through. So I'm just gonna peep my head over the top here. You won't be able to hear me because I will run out of signal probably on this mic. So just keep, just keep watching. And should I come sprinting back, you'll know we've found the cheetah. Can you hear me still? Two babbler fucks. I have this one on the left of me and one on the right of me, and I think that's what's going on. I'm not sure that they were calling at a spotted cat as like anyway we're in the just to give you an idea we're on a road called Rebecca's Road over there is where Philemon's dip is and it's there that Nikki and Brent saw the cheetah coming across through here and somewhere in here of course very thick bush can't go bashing around unless we've kind of spotted him but very encouraging that he actually seems to be trying to find something to eat. So he was obviously on the hunt. We saw some impala a little bit up this road. Three, two, Oops. We saw some impala a little bit up this road and they looked uh, very relaxed indeed. So I don't know. We'll keep going down this road slowly, see if we don't pick up something on the way. Just while I get back in the car, look at the light catching the bush there. I just think it's magnificent. Isn't that pretty, Vian? Very pretty. Okay. Right, here we go. I'm just going to drive very slowly. I might just push the clutch in and roll. No, I won't. I'll have to start the car first. Now we'll roll. Because this is a diesel, of course, so it's a bit noisier than the little Land Rovers. Hello, Debbie in New Jersey. Another wonderfully astute question while we search through here. You want to know what percentage of cheetah hunts are successful? Debbie, I think you'll probably find... Oh, that's a diker. I got... I got so excited, a diker just exploded from the bush there. <laughs> no, not a cheetah. Uh, Debbie, cheetah are a bit like wild dogs, a bit of an anomaly, anomaly in that they're pretty successful. I'd say probably about 40% success rate. And despite that, I mean, a lion and leopard much less successful than that, but despite that, they're still endangered. It's not their hunting skill that makes them endangered, of course. It is the fact that they, sorry, it's the fact that they are threatened by so many other predators. They need such sort of protection and they are so totally over-specialized. Where something like a leopard can live just about anywhere, a cheetah really does need a specific kind of habitat. I haven't seen any tracks crossing the road. stop here and enjoy the sight of the sun setting there quietly and just have a listen and Deborah you're an armchair traveler well that's your Twitter handle and you want to know if I think the cheetah wandered on here because it is so dry and therefore a bit more open Deborah you know it I'd say yes except for the fact that everywhere is quite dry and everywhere is now therefore consequently quite open everywhere is a good place for a cheetah to hunt at the moment unless it's right on the riverbanks where the bush is very thick uh, there'll be lots of clearings around where there are antelope really struggling to make ends meet on the amount of forage that there is available so 
No, I think it's just one of those things. The cheetah will come across here as they do every so often. I keep thinking I hear things, but I, I haven't heard anything. Scott is just over there. James. He's hailing me on the radio. Go ahead. I'm sure where you are. I, have, I headed down to Shibam on Philemon's cut I'm going to head back up to quarantine now. Copy. I'm on Rebecca's still. I've just watched you go past the junction with Philemon's cut line. I think I might turn around and do that road again. Copy. So I think what we're going to do is go back up there, turn around. He was in this block. He may be still heading this way. We did have a herd of impala there and a dica that leapt out of the bush in front of us. Let's go back up this road and see if we can't find anything that side. Just before I turn around, I'm going to go right to the end of this road. Cheetah, at least. <laughs> Diane, not Cheetah. Uh, <laughs> Cheetah, you want to know where Diane sleeps at night? Um, I don't know exactly where Diane sleeps, Cheetah. No, Diane wanted to know, I have a question, and you want to know where cheetahs sleep at night. Um, they sleep probably in some pretty hidden stuff. They'll try and find a bush to hide underneath. They won't sleep soundly, they'll be awake often and looking around. The slightest sound, the slightest smell will make them wake up and look around. But they don't sleep in any kind of burrow. They'll sleep in some kind of undergrowth and thick stuff that they can find. They will move on a moonlit night, on a very sort of full moonlight, a bit like the wild dogs which will hunt on moonlit nights as well. I hope we're going to be lucky going straight up the same road. Now, Patty, it is obviously a drought, and so the obvious question, and it's a good one again, is would the cheetah be looking for water? Patty, the cheetah would probably not be looking for water. I'll tell you why, because in many areas, they occur in sort of semi-desert up in Arabia, in the Kalahari, for example, where they don't drink at all, unless they absolutely have to. And they don't absolutely have to ever if they have sufficient to eat. They get sufficient water from their prey for them to actually not have to drink. They will drink just like many of the other big cats. They will drink if they, if they can, but they don't have to. So I don't think that's this cheetah's priority, no. A beautiful sunset coming up yet again marvelous stuff and I was just thinking as I was walking about quarantine clearings today this morning just before the cheetah was found I was just thinking to myself you know although there's a drought and although the grass is sparse see how that rhymed there Viam? sparse grass you should be listening it's very important and their leaves are wilting on the trees this remains one of the most magical places you could possibly hope to be. Sunsets and sunrises, just a wonderful atmosphere. Hello Thomas, you're watching on YouTube and you're your query is about the danger posed to human beings by cheetahs. Thomas, you say that you know that leopards are dangerous to people and you're guessing the cheetahs are less so. Thomas, leopards are not dangerous to people. No animal is dangerous to a person unless you threaten it. Yes, a, cheetah, a leopard is more likely, if you corner it, to, fight, to, to charge you and be dangerous, but they're not inherently dangerous. I suppose the answer would be yes. Could you stumble upon a cheetah and would it, it would more, much more likely run away from you than a leopard would. But still, I don't want you to get the impression that a leopard is particularly dangerous and a cheetah not so. Cheetah are not dangerous. No animal out here is inherently dangerous. 
there's a beautiful termite mound up ahead, I would be most grateful if the cheetah would just climb up onto the top of that termite mound and silhouette itself against the setting sun. That would be the kindest thing it could do. It's in this block somewhere. I haven't seen any tracks crossing the road. Just keep an eye out here. Of course, it could very, very easily just change direction and go back towards quarantine clearings. Another brilliantly astute question coming from Bethany in Virginia. And you want to know if a cheetah's metabolism is that much faster than that of a lion or a leopard because they have to expend so much energy on the hunt. No, I don't think they have a faster metabolism. I think their energy storage and respiration rates are definitely different. So they will have, um, uh, they'll probably store a bit more energy in their cells. I don't think they would digest necessarily faster and therefore I don't think that they have a, they might have a slightly faster metabolism. I don't think it's that noticeable. They still have to sleep a huge amount. I'd say dogs, wild dogs had a much faster metabolism. Yeah, it's not looking good at the moment. You anyway, know, very exciting that Karula seemed to have killed something. That's really wonderful. Not for the thing that was killed, of course. I think, believe it was a diker. Let's head across to Scott and get an update from his side. I'm going to keep up going, keep going up this road. I may even turn around and do it again. Until then, let's head back across to Scott. So, the search for the cheetah continues, and aren't we lucky to have two vehicles focused in this area on trying to maximise our chances of relocating it? I'm not too sure what to do. I've come back to kind of square one. The cheetah was running kind of parallel to this road, but down in a southerly direction like this. And we've searched fairly well in this block. I mean, there's a chance that lying underneath the bush is the cheetah with a kill or just the cheetah catching its breath. But there's also a strong chance that the cheetah may have crossed over this road. Like I've said, when cheetahs are at full tilt, which it would have been chasing after the parlor, their, their strides can be 20 to 25 meters between touching the ground. Isn't that incredible? So in the 100 meter sprints, they will only touch the ground four times when obviously starting at full, at full speed, not, in, not including their starter. Um, which means that it could have pew over this road, which is, I'm hoping is gonna be the case. And that is why we are going to take Ingwe Alley I hope that we're going to find it somewhere off to our east. We've checked quite extensively further south of here, and by that stage I think it would have been moving more slowly, and therefore more likely that we may have seen a track crossing the road. So that's why I'm thinking maybe east is going to be a good option for us. What's interesting and what would be wonderful to know is how far was that cheetah away from us this morning? Because it was found not too far from where we last had visual of it this morning. So that's interesting thought for us to all mull over. Every track I see now and everything I see now turns into a cheetah. Brian has got the same problem. We both had major false calls earlier. <laughs> With our minds wishfully imagining random objects to be the cheetah. Hello, Robin, who's interested to know where the cheetah will drag their kills up into trees like a leopard will. And no, they will not. They are terrible climbers. 
and although may go up onto the odd termite mound for a vantage point, and sometimes a kind of fallen down tree or a tree with a very easy to climb limb, quite low down, they will hop onto that. But they are, are certainly not good climbers and cannot even be compared to leopards with regards to skill of climbing and hoisting kills which makes their lives difficult, Robin, because they are so weak and can't even stand up to leopard. If they are successful in making a kill, just about anything can chase a cheetah away from it. Lion, leopard, and hyena. Not only can they quite easily chase the cheetah away, but they can often quite easily kill them. That is why it does not make huge amounts of sense for cheetah to hang around the Sabi sands because our lion and leopard viewing is so good. And there are so many lions and leopards here with considerably thick bush. It is a nightmare just waiting to unfold being a cheetah in the Sabi sands. You've got to be very courageous to think this is a good place to live. to Sandy in Florida and you're interested to know how do animals or the herbivores, the prey animals establish what animals are predators and this will be something that they, they learn from their parents. Um, it's not something that's as instinctual as a, 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 a predator's ability to hunt, so the, the opposite of detecting danger um, for, for, for prey animals I guess. The, the predators are born with an instinctual trigger which makes them capable of hunting. Whereas uh, herbivores who grow up in areas where there are no predators and are then released into areas where there are predators, just look at the lion when they walk up to them and then the lions jump on them. So that mistake has been made before where wildebeest from, I think somewhere in Swaziland were re released into a reserve somewhere. And it was like a lion's playground. They killed vast, vast numbers of wildebeest, too many to eat. They would each catch one, feed on some, then go catch a few more. It's a good fun catching predator, uh, prey if you are a predator. So they do enjoy it and they can. No, no different to domestic cats that will catch prey for the fun, not necessarily to feed on them. So obviously when a young herbivore is growing up and it sees its mother in distress running for its life, it follows suit and starts to pick up and understand what exactly predators are and what they smell like. So no luck yet. I'm thinking of possibly doing one more wider loop further south from where we, we, we've checked so far and then link back and hopefully get a glimpse of those lions before the end of the safari. If some of you have joined more recently, there are five lioness lying around not too far from here. Hard to believe they haven't been getting much attention, but it's just been one of those afternoons where we've been incredibly spoiled with some high energy entertainment and sightings. And even though we may not get a glimpse of the cheetah this evening, not that it's over yet, not that we're giving up, there's always tomorrow and the next day. are just up this road called Twin Dams Road, not too far away. Remarkable, I mean the proximity that three of the big cats of Africa were to one another today would have been no more than half a mile. Karula, the lion and the cheetah were all within half a mile of one another today. Saturday we were just a little bit further away than we needed to be from that. Cheetah, and I think we just missed it by seconds as it darted off after the Impala. Hello to 
Brian in Toronto. Um, you interested to know if the three endangered species, wild dog, cheetah, and ground hornbill, whether their numbers have stabilized or if they're decreasing. And to be honest, I don't know the answer to that. And I need to be careful here, but it's also important to remember that as as, as hard as people try to understand exact numbers of these animals, it is incredibly difficult to know exact numbers because the areas that they live in are hugely immense. So often it's speculation, and yes, they are, are getting the most accurate figures possible, but the reality is they may not convey the actual truth. So I don't know though, regardless of what the figures are and what people do think, I do not know what they are. So if anybody does know the answer to that and is willing to share that nugget of information with us, that would be wonderful. Just trying to check carefully just to make sure we don't overlook any signs that may help steer us closer to the cheetah, but no luck yet. I was telling Brian earlier, they've got such skinny feet that not easy business seeing their tracks. They don't leave much behind in the way of a track. But on this nice, soft, sandy road, easy to see the tracks also with the light we're getting because we're heading into the, the kind of sunlight now it's casting a, a, a good angle of light onto the tracks on the road making it a little bit easier for me to see and it can, it can be interesting you can be driving down the same road but from a various you know different direction and one direction at one stage of the day will be very difficult to see the tracks and the other direction at the same time of the day will be very easy and vice versa, so something just to bear in mind when tracking. We have got the odds in our favor now. to see how that is spelt. Um, good to have you with us, and I'm glad none of your cousins were consumed by the cheetah earlier that we know of. Well, not that glad, but just saying that to make you feel better, Antelope. Um, you'd like to know how far do cheetah move during the day, and also how big are their territories? Now, a male cheetah's territory in my history in the Savi Sands will be about 4,000, 5,000, up to even 6,000, 6,000 hectares, so about three times the amount of land that we can traverse here at Juma, at least. So, so large, um, an equivalent size, I guess, to, to a, a male leopard in this area but it will fluctuate greatly. And because I have only spent time literally with one resident male cheetah that I kind of got to know vaguely, um, I've got very limited uh, insights into their specific ongoings. And what you'll find as antelope is that their behavior will differ, differ hugely in various parts of Africa, even within the Kruger, their behavior will be different in terms of territories. The same for leopard. Leopard in this part of Kruger will have different territory sizes to leopards in a different part of Kruger. A drier area, more arid, not as much game. So there's just too many variables to be able to answer a question like that very concisely, and especially with us in the Savi Sands, having basically only vagrant cheetah that come through from time to time.
so that's that antelope and in terms of that's home ranges or, or territories rather in terms of how much distance they'll move in a day again it will depend hugely on each individual day um, but they do have the ability to move very large distances even with the full belly I told the story this morning of uh, a, a cheetah that we saw finish, finishing off a diker kill on the Arethusa airstrip and heading directly east away from there in the morning which takes it far south of where we are, are here on Juma. And then in the afternoon drive, that very same cheetah was sleeping on quarantine clearing. So even though we didn't expect to see it there, it had traveled probably maybe four or five miles. We didn't know its exact footsteps or tracks in the course of the day. So. Maybe we've got time just to shoot down Philemon's dip. And we are going to send you to James, who has got you guys into a good spot for a sundowner. No cheater, I'm afraid, at this stage. And just a few more minutes left before we'll have to call off the search. Of course, they are nocturnal, at least diurnal animals. And so we don't want to chase them around in the night. Well, we don't ever want to chase them around at all. That is a fantastic shot there of the sun going down behind the cloud and it's left this incredible spray along the underside of this well rather pathetic attempt at a rain cloud that has sort of come out of the top of what looks like a thunderhead and you can also see VM was just showing you there was the Gauri repeater at the beginning of uh, the shot and that of course is where most of the signal that you're seeing us through so I think I just turned on the um, the uh, windscreen wipers that's totally superfluous there is no windscreen here of course uh, so the g signal comes from the camera into the backpack on the back of the Mahindra then it goes across to the Gaia repeater into the final control out to the satellite off to London and then into your living room all in the space of about two and a half seconds it's quite an astonishing feat of technology really and the reason I'm stopped here telling you that ridiculous story was well, not ridiculous, it's true, but it's because we're just still having a bit of a listen to see if we can't hear some alarm calls. So let us continue up towards quarantine clearings and just see if the cheetah didn't turn around and come back towards the clearings. <laughs> Now, a question from Cheetah in Texas. And Cheetah in Texas wants to know how often a Jeffrey has to hunt. Um, Jeffrey, a Cheetah has to hunt pretty much as often as it needs to. And I know that sounds like a facetious answer, but it isn't. It really depends on what it kills. So if a cheetah kills a steenbok, for example, then it's going to probably hunt again in the next day or so. If it kills an impala and that impala is not stolen from it, it will probably last it a good four days. Now, normally, if a cheetah kills an adult impala, what will happen is that that impala will eventually be stolen, either by vultures or jackals or leopards or lions or even hyenas and then it will obviously have to try and hunt again. So that's why when you see cheetahs eating, they just about always will try and eat the meat from the hind. They'll eat the, that sort of rich meat in the rump and they'll leave the gut because to take the time to clear the gut out and get at the organs just is too, takes too long for them. Now I think this is round about where Nikki and Brent saw beyond Mr. Shatar just earlier today. I see Brent's large size 13 barefoot and they were sitting on that termite mound. So let's just go down the western edge of the clearing here. Darlene? You're absolutely correct, but there are two aspects to your question that I need to address. The first is you say, does the cheetah's tracks resemble that of a dog mixed with a cat, simply because they don't have the protractable claws? Yes, they do, they do sort of. They more, look more like cats with claw marks in them, because they've got the three lobes at the back, which of course dogs don't have. Dogs have got the two lobes at the back. 
But Dolly, in the second part of your question I wanted to address is that cheetah don't have semi-retractable claws. Cats don't have retractable claws. Cats have protractable claws. Remember the resting position for the claws is inside the sheath. And so to push them out, they protract them out. If they were retractable, the resting position would be that they were out and then they could pull them back in, which isn't the case. And a cheetah has semi-protractable claws. Claws that are half out most of the time and then when they're running, of course, they push them all the way out to act as running spikes. Nice question, thank you, Darlene. This is going to be our last attempt at trying to find this fellow, I'm afraid, because it's getting a bit dark. I just think he might come back towards the clearings here, rather than hunt through that relatively thick woodland. But I might be talking nonsense. I know that what I'm going to look at here is a, is a log. I, I know it is, and I can't bring myself to not look at it just in case. Ah, it's not even a log. It's a cheetah-like clump of grasses. <laughs> you see what I'm looking at? <laughs> Sorry, when I was excitedly looking at that piece of grass there. Patty, you sent through a question. I'm afraid I missed it, so I'm going to ask Kirsty to give it back to me. Ah, now Patty, you want to know if cheetah is solitary. What's their social structure? Patty, cheetah are solitary. Females are solitary. Males on their own, if they're not born with siblings, male siblings are also solitary. But often males will travel together if they are not solid, if they are with siblings. So you'll find coalitions of two or three male cheetah quite frequently. No, there's some impala up ahead looking very chilled out indeed. About to have their evening snifter, not too worried about being overruled and attacked by the fastest mammal on planet Earth. There to the pity. There's another very, very clever and astute query. I'm just going to stop here because there's some Franklin's alarm calling. And it's no coincidence that those Impala have turned around to look. Those Franklin's are alarmed at something. The Impala have turned around to look at them. We'll just stop here. And the question here is, is it possible that a cheetah in full flight would have crossed, could have crossed a road without even touching the road and therefore, you know, been totally invisible? Yes, it is, absolutely. A cheetah's full flight stride is at least four meters. Now that's about 12 and a bit. 13 feet actually, so that's extremely large. All I can hear in the background is some hardy dolls going, <coughs> they're not shouting at the cheetah. The impala are grazing again. Let's continue. Oh, there, get him now, the um, the um. And I tried to show you a, well, it's not the same species, but that's a Koki Franklin calling, and it's calling onomatopoeically. That's why it's called a Koki Franklin. We had some Shelley's Franklins earlier, which I was hoping to show you, but they went beside a bush. How's that view, Vian? Is it okay? Well, Kirsten thinks it's very pretty, Vian. It's not a cheetah, I know. It's spotty. But it is spotty, yes. And it's got some yellow on it. 
beautiful sounds of the evening. <laughs> and Gerda, you want us to keep looking for Nelson, the one-horned, one-eyed impala. Um, okay, we can. We probably won't look for him this evening, but uh, we'll keep our eye out for him. He's a survivor, that one. Well, we think he is. We think that was Nelson this morning. Not this morning, it was two mornings ago, I think. Good heavens. We have a question from Marjorie. Now, Marjorie is a spring chicken. Marjorie is a spring chicken just sh shy of her, um, well, she's only five years shy of a century. Marjorie, I think it deserves a round of applause, but you were out here 30 years ago in the Kruger Park, which is fantastic, and you want to know if anything's changed in this area since the fences came down between us and the Kruger Park. So, just for some background, everybody perhaps doesn't know the background while we keep driving along here. The Kruger Park is 1.8 million hectares, the Kruger Park proper, and until about 1994, it was fenced out from the private nature reserves to the west where we are now, in the Sabi Sands, the Timbavati, and the Manuleti, to the north of us. So until about, oh, just over, what, 20 years ago, it was just just after Marjorie left here the first time, it was fenced out. Now, the fences have come down, and so the area is now 2.2 million hectares. And since then, of course, the area has opened up into Mozambique and to Zimbabwe, so we're now looking at 3.5 million hectares. So it really is an enormous piece of land. And Marjorie, the major differences, I suppose, I think if you went to the Kruger Park, you wouldn't notice a huge difference from that specifically. I think the differences have been definitely noticeable in the private nature reserves, lots more elephants, lots more movement of animals in and out of these private areas. But Marjorie, the big difference, of course, since you were last here, is that a lot of the Kruger National Park water points have been closed. And that's because they realized that the water points that they had were creating a lack of biodiversity because many impala and zebra were just out competing everything else. So I think you'd actually find, come back if you were to come back and find everything in a much greater state of health than it was 30 years ago when you visited, when you were a spring chicken of just 65 years. Wonderful. Thank you, Marjorie. Thank you for giving us of your time to watch, and thank you for telling us that you came out here. Keep talking to us. It's wonderful to hear from you. Audrey, you learned how to use a computer when you were 90 years old. I think that is absolutely fantastic. I would love to put you in touch with various members of my family who are probably 20 years younger than you are and are utterly incompetent on in computer. In fact, some of our staff, which are pushing 70 years younger than you, are not so sharp on a computer. So perhaps you can come out and give a computer course to a couple of our staff members. Good for you, Marjorie. Keep watching. Keep tweeting away. Okay, we're going to have to turn some lights on now, I think. VM very kindly provided a spotlight for the day. Incredibly powerful spotlight here. VM is blinding, isn't it? Right, we're no longer really looking for the cheetah. If we saw it, we might give it a brief glimpse, but then we'd have to leave it alone. Because, of course, this is a, a diurnal animal, as I said. Now, I'm not sure if you will notice, I'll ask VM to change the angle up slightly, but we're going to drive exactly the same road that we were driving, just in case.
Hello, Chris Applegate. That's a very encouraging and exciting thing you've just said to us. You said since you've started watching these shows, you've decided that you're going to go to college. I'm not sure how old you are if you're going back for a second stint or your first stint, and you're going to become a wildlife biologist. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Please do not let your dreams, don't let anyone dissuade you from your dreams. Of course, you will have a completely unmarketable degree by the time you've finished, but it will lead you into possibly one of the most satisfying careers you could ever hope to have. So please do go and do that and keep us posted as to how it goes. Good stuff, Chris, thanks. Not a lot going on around here by way of leopard or cheetah. Of course, we have had three of the big cats here. In fact, the only three big cats that we have here all today, which is wonderful. Cheetah, lion, and leopard. Now, it was my intention to go to the hyena den during the course of this evening, but that will have to be tomorrow. Before the light fades completely, let's head across to Scott, get an update from him. I'm going to keep driving down this road and I'll see you just now. So, unfortunately, no luck with the cheetah, but we tried for as long as we, we kind of could, I guess, without neglecting these ladies, which are just up ahead of us too much. And we drove past just a minute ago and saw a couple lying up ahead of us, but then looped here just to make sure none were possibly on their way to the Juma waterhole for a drink, but that didn't appear to be the case. I'm not sure where the other... Lying. Oh, they're all here, actually. They're just all carpeted on top of one another. So much so. I'm just going to try and position the vehicles. Uh, Brian's in a slightly better spot. There we go. That, I think, will work for now. So I was wrong. All five ladies are still carpeted amongst one another. What are you guys thinking? It's boiling. It is not weather for snuggles. But a beautiful scene to look at, that's for certain. I'm just glad I'm not in and amongst them. And even though they're not up to too much now, I'm almost certain they're gonna come for a drink at the gym or water some stage this evening. I know it's not very well lit up there, but you may be able to get a few glimpses of them and shadows as they come for a drink. I'm not sure what the moon is doing tonight. It should be getting bigger and brighter as the days go on, so hopefully the moonlight will start assisting with that waterhole cam. An interesting point that Brian brought up that I hadn't thought of, <clears throat> we've kind of forgotten about in all the action this afternoon is that when we heard Karula making that diker kill earlier, I wonder if these lions couldn't hear it as well. I mean, it was quite far north of them, but their, their senses are just so much better than ours that maybe they could. But maybe it was just a bit too far off to warrant them running all that way. But it would have been very interesting if there was another vehicle sitting here when that whole event unfolded to notice how far they can actually hear a sound like that. And then, of course, that leads us to think about Karula and how she's enjoying her meal, whether she's hoisted it up into a tree. Sadly, I feel she is going to be able to enjoy that meal without having any of us coming around to enjoy watching her have it because it's just impenetrably thick in that riverbed, or in that portion of riverbed, and even to walk through there is tricky. Interesting thought and questions just come through from Mr. Tuvok. And he would like to know, is it possible to somehow age or at least 
help aged lion by looking at the yellowness of their teeth. And it's something that I haven't thought of until you've asked this question now. Um, but yes, I mean, I think it certainly could be quite an accurate indicator of lion's age. I mean, I'm not sure if anybody has monitored the yellowing of uh, multiple different lions and getting a kind of average, average age white up until X amounts of years. Yellowing begins at seven or eight years and 12 onwards, it's extra yellow, for example. It's possible, certainly possible, but I'm not too sure if it can be used accurately and whether, you know, individual species, uh, you know, individual lions and their individual genetics and the area that they live in, the food that they feed on and the life that they lead may indicate them to all be, or cause them rather, to be all a little bit different. And I guess, again, when asking any of these questions, we can look at humans. And I know that if you look at a group of your friends or colleagues, anyone, and you line up 100 people of various ages, I'm sure you'll get varying results regarding yellowness or whiteness, regardless of the age. But an interesting thought, Mr. Tuvok. Fast asleep, and I'm sure now they are really enjoying the much cooler temperatures. I'm not too sure what the temperature is now. I'm guessing maybe 20 degrees Celsius, which is a drastic drop from when we started this afternoon at 36 degrees Celsius. But it's definitely cooled down into a marvelous evening. Shame, I've just heard that James is having some trouble on his vehicle with the camera again. A little pea shooter is playing up. And he's going to do his best to try and fix it because he would like to say goodbye to all of you. But a prior warning that they may not be able to solve this problem in time. There's just a few minutes left of today's safari. And what a safari it's been. We almost, for the first time in my history with Wild Earth, got the big cat trifecta. We were seconds away. And next time, I'm just going to have to drive faster in that situation. But I did fear that we may lose our cameraman, and that would be obviously detrimental on many levels, but mainly the fact that you'd arrive at the sighting and then not be able to film it. So obviously then you'd have to deal with the cameraman afterwards. All in all, not a situation you want to be in. And it's very easy, it's a very easy mistake that a lot of guides make, especially early on in their careers, is that sitting up in the front chair in a comfortable bucket seat where there's the least bumpy ride on the whole vehicle gives you a false sense of what it's like for everyone else. And right here, we've just got the cameraman behind us to worry about, but the, the regular uh, guides with their guests, three rows, have got all kinds of problems to negotiate, trying to get each uh, guest into a gap to see the lion when the bush is thick. Another interesting thing that I should forewarn everyone is that when people go on safari, it's like a naughty school kid syndrome kicks in, even for adults, and everyone wants to sit at the back of the bus. But those are the worst seats. You are the highest off the ground, therefore giving you often the worst angle photographically, and you are also in the bumpiest seat in the house. So do not make that mistake on safari. Always try and sit as close to your guide as possible. Unless, of course, you fi find him painful, then the back seat would probably be beneficial. But it will still be bumpy. So a little bit of rolling over and stretching. They are showing signs of coming to life. So that's some good news. And 
Isn't James showing just how committed he is to all of you guys? He's racing around, trying his best to, to get the camera working. And it looks like there may be a chance that he does, in fact, get his one minute to say goodbye to all of you guys. So we're going to say goodbye now in case that he is ready. If he's not, then you'll just be able to enjoy the Lions for the final minute. But guys, thanks so much for an incredibly memorable afternoon on safari. Haven't we all been so, so lucky? Maybe next time we'll get the cheetah and the trifecta, but that's the beauty of being safari. Always nice to leave something for next time. Well done, Brian, on camera. And well done to the thumb. And we're going to send you over now to James. Maybe he'll give you one last quick view of the line so you can say goodbye to them. And then over to James when you guys are ready.